The design of cities begins with streets and squares and neighborhoods, but it also depends on parks and open spaces and the connections between them. Parks, greenways, and blueways give form to the neighborhoods and bring nature into the city. In many ways, the modern profession of city planning was born with parks. Progressive reformers concerned with public health in the smoky industrial cities turned to landscape architects to create ample, green, open to the sky spaces where people could relax amid nature and the water and air would be cleaner. Frederick Law Olmsted's idea for Boston's emerald necklace of interconnected parks and green corridors was a public health idea, a water cleanup idea, not just a recreational one. And the first American to identify himself as a professional city planner, John Nolan, was in fact a landscape architect. By training, he had a long career in parks planning already under him uh, when he began devising new towns and reshaping old ones. These innovators realized that the planning of neighborhoods and transportation corridors and the establishment of open spaces were not separate acts to be dealt with in their own separate professional silos. And they understood that the green parts of a city aren't just leftovers ignored in between the built up areas that receive all sorts of attention from architects, engineers, real estate developers. Instead, the natural and green parts should be subjects of design in themselves. They taught us that that allowed for restoration and maximizing community benefits and ecological values. Today, parks and recreation programs are often operated in their own separate departments, quite apart from the day-to-day -day work of city planning. But really all the plans should be integrated, especially now when park spaces hold the life-saving, economy-saving solutions for urbanism in an era of climate change. Everyone deserves a great park. A basic national goal has been set of having park space within 10 minutes walk of every home. That's a start. But it's not just a matter of keeping the distances short. We also need good means of getting there. Non-motorized transportation on bike-friendly, walk-friendly streets and multi-user trails are all needed to connect our local parks to where we live and where we work and go to school. Today we should think of what Mitchell Silver calls parks without borders, extending through these connections to give everyone the option of a park life. Even larger scale trail systems like the East Coast Greenway are gradually taking the interconnected web of park life to the next level, allowing for long non-motorized commutes and for bike tourism. The traditions in landscape architecture show us that parks, greenways, and waterways take their best form from listening closely to the lay of the land, from looking at the way the topography rolls and folding in the natural courses of stormwater. 
In this way, the continuum of green supports not just human happiness, but flood control, water quality, flyways for birds, pollinator corridors for winged insects, the food web, and adaptation to climate change and sea level rise. Miami-Dade Parks Director Maria Nardi likes to say, parks just might save the world. Putting all this together, modern day practitioners like David Barth described a continuum of green that extends from the tiniest tot lot to the pocket park, to the community garden, to the neighborhood square, to recreational fields and large scale parks, and on to restoration of wilderness and conservation areas, all interconnected by greenways tree-lined streets, broad green boulevards, and trails. Parks, greenways, and blueways. They might be number 12 on this list of town planning stuff everyone needs to know, but they're of primary importance because they affect everything. For more information, check out the National Recreation and Parks Association's 10-minute walk commitment campaign, and go to the NRPA website to learn how to become a park champion.